Okay, if you'll all just gather around me for a few seconds, I'll give you a wee bit of information about this glorious building in front of you. The guide smiled encouragingly at a group of tired and somewhat bedraggled looking tourists milling around the front of St. Anne's Shandon Church. That's it, darling, he cajoled in his exaggerated Irish lilt, the emerald green scarf in his hand waving in patient circles around his portly frame. Move in a little closer, young lady, I won't bite you. His smile widened, revealing a bottom row of spectacularly stained and crooked teeth. Good thing her husband hadn't made the trip to Ireland after all, Marcy Taggart thought, taking several reluctant steps forward. He'd have interpreted the poor man's lack of a perfect smile as a personal affront. People spend all this money on facelifts and designer clothes and they forget about the most important thing of all, their teeth, he often fumed. Peter was an orthodontist and therefore prone to such pronouncements. Hadn't he once told her that the first thing that had attracted him to her wasn't her slim figure or her large, dark brown eyes, but rather her obvious regard for oral hygiene, as evidenced by her straight, flawlessly white teeth? To think she'd once found such statements flattering, even romantic. Marcy marveled at it now. Can I have your full attention, please? The tour guide asked with only a hint of reproach in his voice. He was clearly used to the casual rudeness of those in his charge and had ceased to take offense. Even though the largely middle-aged group of 24 men and women had paid a lot of money for the day's excursion to Cork, the Republic of Ireland's second largest city with a population of approximately 120,000, only a handful of those in attendance had actually been paying attention to anything the man had been saying since leaving Dublin. Marcy had tried, she really had. She'd repeatedly instructed herself to focus as the guide educated them on the history of Cork during the seemingly interminable bus ride, 168 miles of severely congested highway and narrow country roads. She'd learned that the name Cork was derived from the Irish word carcax, meaning marshy place, because of its situation on the River Lee that it had been founded in the 6th century AD and now served as the administrative center of County Cork, and that it was the largest city in the province of Munster. Corkorians, as they were known, often referred to Cork as the real capital of Ireland. Its nickname was the Rebel County, the town's reputation for rebelliousness having something to do with its support of the, the English pretender Perkin Warbeck back in 1491 following the War of the Roses. Today it was better known as the heart of industry in the south of Ireland, the chief industry being pharmaceuticals, its most famous product, none other than Viagra. At least that's what Marcy thought their guide had said. She couldn't be sure. Her imagination had an unfortunate tendency to get the better of her these days, and at 50, her once prodigious memory for facts both useful and otherwise was no longer what it used to be. But then, she thought, grit-filled eyes surreptitiously scanning the glazed faces of her fellow travelers, all clearly years past their best-before date, what was? As you can see, because of its envious hilltop position, the Tower of St. Anne Shandon Church dominates the entire north side of the city, the guide was saying now, his voice rising to be heard over the other competing tour groups that had suddenly materialized and were jockeying for position on the busy street corner. St. Anne's is Cork's prime landmark, and its giant pepper pot steeple, which was built in 1722, is widely regarded as a symbol of the city. Okay, you have 30 minutes to visit the inside of the church. For those of you who have seen enough and would prefer to enjoy a bit of rest and relaxation before heading back to the bus, there's no shortage of pubs in the area. We'll meet back at Parnell Place bus station in one hour. Please be prompt or we might not have enough time to visit Blarney Castle on our way back to Dublin. And you don't want to miss out on kissing the legendary Blarney Stone, do you? No, we certainly wouldn't want to miss out on that, Marcy thought, recalling Peter's revulsion at the idea of being held by his feet and suspended backward and upside down like a bat in order to kiss, quote, some dirty piece of bacteria-soaked gray rock coated with other people's saliva, end quote. 
as he'd so memorably phrased it when she'd first shown him the brochures. Who in their right mind would want to do such a thing? He'd asked accusingly. Marcy had smiled and said nothing. Peter had ceased believing she was in her right mind some time ago. Wasn't that why she'd agreed to go on this trip in the first place? Hadn't everyone been telling her that it was important, some said crucial, for both her mental health and her marriage, that she and Peter spend more time together, time in which they could come to terms with what had happened as a unit? Wasn't that the term her psychiatrist had used? So when her sister had first floated the idea of a second honeymoon in honor of their 25th wedding anniversary, Marcy had thrown herself into its planning with every fiber of her being. It had been Peter's suggestion to go to Ireland, his mother having been born in Limerick. He'd been talking for years of making a pilgrimage to the land of his ancestors. Marcy, Mar Marcy initially argued in favor of somewhere more exotic, like Tahiti or Bali some place where the average July temperature was substantially more than 66 degrees, where she could sit Mai Tais on the beach and wear flowers in her hair, instead of a place where guineas was the order of the day, and the humidity would pretty much guarantee she'd always look as if a clump of unruly moss had just landed on her head. But what difference did it make where they went, she reasoned, as long as they went there as a unit. So Peter's choice it was, and ultimately, Peter had chosen someone else. Did one person still qualify as a unit? Marcy wondered now, recognizing that as much as she loved the often spectacular scenery and the much vaunted 40 shades of green of the Irish countryside, she hated its dull, rain-filled skies and the pervasive dampness that clung to her like a second skin. He couldn't take any more drama, he'd said when he told her he was leaving. It's better this way. We'll both be better off. You'll see, you'll be much happier. Hopefully, eventually, we can be friends. The cowardly cliches of the deserter. We still have a son together, he told her, as if she needed reminding. No mention of their daughter. Marcy shivered, gathering the sides of her trench coat together and deciding to join the ranks of those opting for a brief respite and a pint of beer. They'd been on the go since their bus had pulled out of Dublin at 8.30 that morning. A quick lunch at a traditional Irish pub when they'd first arrived in Cork had been followed by a three-hour walking tour of the city. Since Cork Centre was located on an island lying between two branches of the River Lee, the city naturally divided into three main sections. The downtown core, known as the flat of the city, the North Bank, and the South Bank. Marcy had spent the entire afternoon crossing one bridge after another. It was time to sit down.